to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The scripture says, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. We welcome you to our study of the life and work of a gospel preacher and elders. We hope that you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to study this very encouraging subject together. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. The Greek word that you find in the New Testament for elder is really a combination of several different words. In fact, in our English Bible, there are six English words that are used to describe the office of an elder, yet in the Greek New Testament, there's only three words. We'll take just a moment to discuss those words to help us understand exactly what office it is, what work it is that we're talking about in the New Testament. The first Greek word, which is often translated by one of two English words, is the word presbyteros. And that word means elder, or it may be translated as presbyter. And the meaning behind that is someone, it means the idea of governed by elders or overseen by an eldership. And so this word is used like in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, when Paul writes to the elders at Ephesus. They're the overseeing body of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in that area. Then there is the Greek word episkopos, and it may be translated by one of two English words. It is either the word bishop or overseer, and it means those who are in charge of, those who are looking over the body of Christ. It's used in Acts 20, verse number 28, shepherd the flock of God among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. One who's looking out for and looking over and, and watching out for the flock of God's people. And then the third Greek word that may be again translated by two English words, one of two, is the word poimain. And that is the word for shepherd or some translations will use the term pastor. And it implies, implies again, leadership qualities. It implies one who's leading the flock, one who's watching out for the flock of God's people. Used both in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 5, shepherd the flock of God, Acts 20, verse 28. Now, here's what's interesting, though. This word poimain, which sometimes is translated pastor, doesn't apply to the preacher. Now, listen real carefully. 
When we talk about the work of an elder, we're talking about elders being the pastors. In the New Testament, you do not find in any way, shape, or form the preacher identified as the pastor. The word pastor in both the Greek and our New Testament translations refers to the work of an elder. And so sometimes I hear people say, well, who's your pastor down there? Wait a minute now. The elders, plurality of, were the pastors in the New Testament, and the preacher was not used with that designation. That was not applied to the local work of the preacher. That's the work of the elders. And so if we're going to have the, the kind of organization that the Scripture describes with the life and work of an elder and preacher, we need to realize what the Holy Spirit designates their function as. In the local congregation, there is a plurality of elders. Acts chapter 14 verse number 17. Those elders are the shepherds. They're the overseers. They're the ones put in place by God as the pastor and the, as the pastors and then the preacher works with a local congregation under the eldership simply to proclaim the message of God. Words like preacher, evangelist, minister are used in the Bible to describe the work and function of a preacher but we don't find that terminology of pastor used to describe that. And so let's take just a few moments. And what we're going to do in these lessons is we're going to look at Paul's address to the elders in Acts chapter 20 as he speaks to them as elders and as he will give himself as the evangelist in that scenario. And we're going to let the Holy Spirit define in those texts what the work of elders and the work of preachers is all about. Let's begin with the life and work of an elder. In Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, we first learn that part of the life and work of godly elders is to be mindful about how they live their life. Look in Acts chapter 20, and I want you to notice again verse number 28. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. With that encouragement, take heed to yourself. Part of the life of an elder and work of an elder is to look to his own life and to make sure that he's living the way God wants him to live. We have in 1 Timothy chapter 3, both in verse 2 and in verse 7, that their life is to be one of self-control, Life is to be lived in harmony with the teaching of Christ. Titus chapter 1 verse 6, their life is to follow the principles that you find in the Bible. And so as we think about the life and work of an elder, who's going to follow or get behind somebody whose life is in shambles, whose life is not being lived according to the teaching of Christ. And so we talk about their reputation. We talk about how people in the world view them. We talk about how they live. Are they trustworthy? Are they, why are all those qualities and qualifications in there? Because, friend, if they're not living the way God wants them to live, how in the world can they shepherd the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so we're looking for men who are going to live Exemplary, for exemplary lives. We're looking for men who are honest, who are trustworthy, who their word actually means something when they say it, who are trying to pattern their life after the teaching of Jesus. Now, friend, we're not saying these men are perfect. Nobody, none of us are perfect. We all, from time to time, fall short. But they are to be above reproach. They are to be men who, when things do happen, are willing to make it right and try to get in harmony with the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the first major thing Paul says is, take heed to yourselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul, as he speaks about his own life, will say this. He says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Every leader in the Lord's church must look to his own life first. Get your own house in order before we can begin to teach and shepherd others as well. A second quality that Paul will mention in Acts chapter 20, as we think about the life and work of an elder, they've got to be focused on the spiritual welfare of the church. Their priority must be the spiritual welfare of the church. Notice again Acts 20 verse 28. Paul says, therefore take heed to yourselves. Now listen to this. And to all the flock 
What's the work and life of an elder to be about? Friend, listen carefully. I understand that it may require some type of business skill. I understand that you may have to manage certain things, but that's not the top priority. What's the top priority in the work of an elder in the Lord's church? Take heed to yourselves and the flock. They are to be concerned about the spiritual welfare of God's people. Now, what does that imply and what does that mean? It implies and it means that they're responsible for them. I want you to notice a text from Hebrews chapter 13 that teaches us the importance of elders and making sure that they realize their job is a very serious job. Listen to Hebrews 13, verse number 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Now notice this. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. And so when you take on the work of an elder, you're taking on a serious responsibility in which ultimately you're going to be responsible for the souls you shepherd. Now, does that mean you can make them do something? No, it's not what we're saying. Does that mean you can force them? That's not the idea. But you've got to do your best to give the spiritual interest of the flock top priority, meaning that we want to provide opportunities for spiritual growth. We want to provide Bible study. We want to provide encouragement. We want to provide opportunities where they can learn and grow. When somebody's life is not like it ought to be, and friend, we love them. We want them to go to heaven. But when their life is not like it ought to be, steps must be taken to do our best to bring them back. You know, here's what happens a lot of time. Somebody's in the body of Christ and they and for some reason or another, they, their life gets caught up in sin and they just kind of drop off and nobody knows what happened. We never check on them and nobody knows what's going on. Elders on the day of judgment are given a given account if they don't try their best to reach them. I'm not saying you can make them. I'm not saying you can force them. But have you called on them? Did you talk to them? Have you encouraged them to repent? Have you talked to them about the passages in the Bible that teach disfellowship is necessary to save their soul and must be practiced if they continue to live in that type of lifestyle? The spiritual interest of the flock, God's people, must be top priority. Then a third principle, which we see in Acts chapter 28, is to realize that part of the life and the work of an elder, especially their work, means that in matters of expediency, in matters of functioning and fulfilling the work of God, elders do have the authority. Listen again to Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and all the flock. Now listen to this. Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. God Himself has placed elders as the overseers, those who are uh, in charge of the matters of expediency and in charge of the local congregation as far as we're going to follow the Bible and do what the book says. God's given us commandment. We know what His law is. His word is uh, final. But in the fulfilling of that and in expedient matters, elders do have the authority. I want you to listen to another passage in which Peter, or another passage in which Peter discusses the elders and their authority. Notice 1 Peter chapter 5, and I want you to listen to what is said. And this is the not only their authority, but this is the right mindset to approach it in. 1 Peter chapter 5, I want you to listen to verse 1. Peter says, The elders who are among you I exhort. I who am a fellow elder, and so he's speaking from an elder standpoint, and a witness of the suffering of Christ, also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. Now, how do you do that? Not by compulsion, because somebody forced you, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, not because you're going to get a paycheck, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Is it true that elders have been given divine authority by God in these matters? Sure. How do they use that authority? Do they use it as a whipping stick? Do they use it to force people into submission? That's not the idea. As examples to the flock. Must they 
set standards? Do they have to make decisions on how the Lord's money is going to be used in evangelism, how we're going to grow, how people are going to be reached, how the functionality of all that? Sure, they have that authority. But friend, the best way you can ever do that is by leading as an example. Elders don't need to sit in the back and say, we formulated this plan, you go out and do it. No, that'll never work. We formulated this plan, we're going to be out leading it, we're encouraging you to help us with that work. That's the best approach you can ever take. And so, yes, they've been given divine authority by God, but that authority must be used in the right way and form so that God and His church can ultimately be glorified in all that is said and done. Now, let's talk about a fourth aspect of the life and work of an elder from Acts chapter 20, verse 28 following. Elders in the Lord's church must be good leaders of God's people. Listen again to Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you uh, shepherds of God's people. Shepherd the church of God, they are told in Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. If you think about the idea of a shepherd, you can see the leadership that's necessary. Now, you've got to place yourself kind of in the mindset of the day and age of the people to whom Paul is talking. And many of these people may have come from that type of background. They may have been shepherds with sheep in the field that would have followed them. And you realize that the good shepherd, he lays down his life for his sheep, he feeds them, he takes care of them. They're like his own family, as it were. And wherever the good shepherd goes... Those sheep are more than happy to follow him. They know safety. They know food. They know comfort. They know the best life comes from following the shepherd wherever he goes. How true especially that must be in the work, the life and work of an elder. People will get behind somebody who's a good leader, who's got their best interest at heart, who's trying to live a good life as he ought to, who's trying to provide good spiritual food for them, and who brings safety and prosperity to that flock. And friend, you can look and see good leaders can have a, a, an infectious, a, a very good way of reaching out to others, and that good work can be seen among the congregation. So we want people who are good leaders. I understand that this doesn't fit Everybody. There are some people who are not leaders, not designed necessarily with that type of mentality. I believe they might grow into that, but people who just stem from that, who have that quality, those are the kind of people we need in the Lord's church who are going to try their best to lead God's people. You see, Jesus is the chief shepherd. 1 Peter 5, verses 3 and 4. And friend, we can look to His life. We can look to His teaching. We can look to the sacrifices that He made. We can look to the good that He did. And that type of life, it makes you want to get behind Him and follow Him. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.21 That's not hard when you see where those footsteps lead. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate, imitate Christ. And as I look to Christ's life, you talk about somebody you want to follow. There it is. We need elders like that in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another quality that we mention as it relates to Paul's address to the elders in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 is that elders must realize the awesome responsibility and privilege of being an elder. It is both a responsibility and a privilege. How do we know that? Listen again to Acts 20 verse 28. Shepherd the church of God. Now listen to this which he purchased with his own blood. Now, friend, I just want you to stop for just a moment and think about the price that was paid for the Lord's church. Jesus said, I will build my church. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. One day, Christ is coming back and He's going to take with Him those who are in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. The church is the divine, eternal plan of Almighty God. Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11. And it's that place of safety where all the saved are. The Lord added to the church daily who the, those who are being saved. Now, in view of all that, elders have the high privilege and awesome responsibility of taking care of and leading people in the Lord's church. Again, be reminded of Hebrews 13, 17. We're to obey those who rule over us and to be watchful, for they give an account for our souls.
Christmas. It is a privilege to lead God's people in the Lord's church. You could have no higher, uh, more noble, more serious work in all the world than being an elder in the Lord's church. Both teaching and encouraging and trying to help people get to heaven. And then it's also an awesome responsibility. You have the responsibility of trying to lead God's people to heaven. And so, yes, it is a very, very serious matter. Now, we say this and emphasize it for this reason. Sometimes I think people, you know, think it'd be nice to be an elder. But friend, you've got to think about the seriousness of that. It is a great thing. Greatest work in all the world, I believe. But friend, you've got to think about that seriously. Are you willing to commit the effort? Are you willing to commit the time? And we say this in all honesty, are you willing to commit the heartache that may come when people don't follow the teaching of Christ? Are you willing to commit to doing your best to try to help people grow and, and uh, come to an understanding? Will you try to help fill the Great Commission? As Jesus said, that's the work even of the local congregation. And so, yes, while it is a serious responsibility and privilege, friend, it's the greatest work in all the world. Let's also mention this as part of the life and work of an uh, elder in the Lord's church. In Acts chapter 20, verse number 29, Paul is now going to emphasize part of the work of an elder is to protect the Lord's church from false doctrine and false teachers. Listen to Acts 20, verse 29. Paul says this, here's something you can be sure of. I know this, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. You know, when you think about a shepherd out in the field and you think about the main threat, it's the wolf. The coyote or the wolf, as we would think of, has got to be the main. If you ever raise cattle, it's a big threat even with that. You know, you've got cattle and they're having calves and those calves are vulnerable, vulnerable and a coyote might slip in. You've got to be watchful. You've got to be alert. You've got to be on guard. How much more so spiritually? Among God's people, there are those who are going to be babes in Christ. There are those who, during certain times in their life, may be vulnerable. What's the work of an elder to be? To make sure that those savage wolves don't come in and tear up the flock. Now, what might be some of those savage wolves, false teachers? Friend, it is a very serious thing to stay alert and make sure that false teaching does not occur. Now, let me use a type of language that won't be hard for us to understand. How serious is it? Titus 1, verses 7 through 10, the Bible says elders. Now, you listen to the, you listen to the bold, you listen to the brash statement here, are to stop the mouths of those who contradict. Don't even let it happen. If somebody starts teaching false doctrine, deal with it and make sure that that's not taught in the Lord's church. And so one of the savage wolves might be false teaching. Another savage wolf that may come in and it may be in a different look, may be sin. You know, we can't let somebody who's blatantly living in sin be in fellowship and act like everything's okay or that's going to spread to everybody else. You get a disease among cattle or you get a disease among sheep and they're all going to the same water and hold or the same feed trough. That disease is going to spread like wildfire. Sin is a disease. And if elders allow sin to be in the camp and go unchecked, friend, that is a savage wolf that will destroy the Lord's church. Let me mention a third one. And this is something that elders do have the, the power to stem the tide on. Another savage wolf that I don't think we see because it doesn't necessarily come with teeth glaring and snarling at us is that of apathy. Too many times we kind of get in a rut. Too many times, if we're not careful, we just kind of do things because we've always done them and nothing really changes. And we go to worship and we sing and we pray and we hear the Word of God and we go home and we get in that route. We've got to make sure that people are busy in the work of God. Be steadfast, immovable, Paul says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And, and elders can't, I know they can't make anybody, but they need to provide opportunities. They need to give encouragement. They need to be out leading the way. They need to be talking to people when they're growing lax and encouraging them and doing what we can to help them with God's family and all that we do. We need to strive to make sure those things are staying true to the teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All right, another aspect of the life and work of an elder that we want to mention is this. An elder or the eldership has got to kind of keep a check 
on one another. Now, where does that come from? Listen to Acts 20, verse 30. From among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Friend, we can see that beginning to happen in the New Testament. In 2 and 3 John, you've got Diotrephes, who wanted to have the preeminence. Is it very far after that? And you've got people trying to rise up and be the one man over the congregation. Church history reveals that, which ultimately led to the papacy. What can we do to stem that tide? In the local congregation, there's always a plurality of elders, Acts 14, 17. Those elders need to keep a check on one another. If someone's not living right inside the eldership, teaching right, you know, we need to encourage. They're part of the flock too, are they not? Don't elders have a responsibility to each other and to watch out for each other? And so if somebody's not living right or teaching right, that's got to be addressed and dealt with inside the local congregation of the Lord's people so that the leadership does not come infected with disease and by that would become fruitless in its work. Now friend, as we've thought today about the work of an elder, we mentioned that being a member of the Lord's church and a shepherd over that is the most serious responsibility, but it's also the greatest privilege. Friend, have you taken advantage of that privilege? Are you a member of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus promised, I'll build my church, Matthew 16, 18. He made the plea, let whosoever will come and drink freely. In Revelation chapter 22, uh, verse 10 following. And friend, Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Friend, if not, we encourage you today to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Having heard that Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Son of God, would you believe that with all your heart? In Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are going down the road. Hey, here's water. What hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts 8, verse 36 following. Having believed, would you confess Jesus as the Son of God? Repent of those things in your life that are not right. Acts 3, verse 19. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And would you do what they did in the New Testament to have your sins forgiven? Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins and you'll receive the crown of eternal life. Acts 2.38 and 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. If you need to obey the gospel, we encourage you to do that. And may every elder in the Lord's church truly strive to live according to God's teaching. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Dot com. Call us toll free at 1 855 458 3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.